Hello and welcome back to the alphabet of astronomy. Today is brought to you by the letter M and M is for metallicity. <laughs> so like the word suggests, metallicity is just a simple measure of the abundance of metals in something. But there's a bit of a catch here. <laughs> now, if you've been following me, you've probably heard me talk about this before, but in astronomy, metal does not refer to what you might normally think of as a metal. In fact, in astronomy, a metal means anything that is not hydrogen or helium. Yes, any other element is considered a metal. Carbon, metal. Oxygen, metal. Nitrogen, metal. Iron, metal. It's all metal. Now, this is kind of one of those weird quirks of astronomy, which is can be a quirky field, in part just because of its very long history. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to say whether astronomers are, are abashed of this kind of strange metal definition or proud of it, or maybe both. <laughs> I don't know, but there are actually reasons for it. This wasn't completely arbitrary on the part of astronomers. For one thing, 98% of baryonic or normal matter in the universe is hydrogen or helium. So it kind of makes sense that you really are mostly concerned with hydrogen and helium and everything else you might lump together in one category. Okay, but then why use the word metals for that, especially when metal kind of already had a kind of somewhat accepted definition? Well, I'm not sure that this has actually ever been explicitly determined for sure what the origination of this term to apply to all elements was. But kind of what seems to have happened is the fact that one, because all of these elements are kind of trace compared to hydrogen and helium, we can just pick one of these elements and kind of use it and pretend <laughs> that all of the other non-hydrogen helium elements have the same abundance, even though we know this isn't true, but it's just kind of a first order approximation. And two, historically speaking, the first non-hydrogen and helium elements that were identified in stars, the, the sun, were actually in fact what we would typically think of as metals, that is things that are shiny and can conduct electricity. So this goes back to the early 19th century and a German physicist named Joseph von Fraunhofer, maybe. I don't speak German, I apologize if I'm butchering these names. Now back in about 1814, he first noticed these dark lines in the otherwise rainbow spectrum of the sun. And he kind of noted what wavelengths they occurred at and labeled them with various letters, um, but didn't know what they were. It wasn't until several decades later when another German physicist and a chemist, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen, two names you might recognize, noticed that these dark lines in the sun spectrum actually matched with the bright emission lines of certain elements that they were burning in their lab. And basically some of these major Fraunhofer lines were actually related to sodium, magnesium, iron, uh, mercury, basically, like I said, actual <laughs> metals. And so it kind of made sense maybe to kind of expand that then once they realized that there were other elements as well. Um, so I think this is probably the origination of why we use the term metals to refer to all of the non-hydrogen and helium elements, but in any case, we do. So back to metallicity. <laughs> metallicity is a measure of the fraction of metals, i.e. non-hydrogen and helium, usually represented by the capital letter Z, and it's usually measured by kind of one minus the amount of hydrogen minus the amount of helium. Now for the sun, Z is about 0.012, but this is actually a somewhat complicated measurement to make because depending on how you measure it, you can get different values because there are different um, things that you're probing in the sun. So for example, by looking at the spectrum of the sun, you're kind of looking at the sun's surface. We can actually take direct samples of the solar wind, which is material that's being blown off of the sun, and we can measure the metal fraction in that and use that to infer metallicity of the sun. And we can actually also infer metallicity from what's called helioseismology, which as the name kind of suggests is the study of how the sun shakes, right? Sun quakes and things like that. Um, and so it, it can get pretty complicated, but generally it's about 1.2%. And of course we can't do that kind of measurement for any other, you know, stars besides the sun. So for everything else, we generally use this spectral method or looking at the lines in a spectrum to kind of determine the chemical abundances. Now we're gonna talk more about spectra in a later video, so I'm not gonna to get too much into the details, but all I'm gonna say is that looking at a spectrum can give you some chemical abundances. So rather than giving a Z value for other stars, the most typical way that metallicity is measured or referenced is actually in terms of a ratio of iron to hydrogen, and then that ratio relative to the sun's ratio of iron to hydrogen, and then take the base 10 logarithm of that. <laughs> Does that sound confusing? It, it is a little bit, but it's, it's, it's straightforward once you get used to it. There's just a, a lot of um, 
moving pieces there. So basically we're saying the amount of iron relative to hydrogen in the sun is a known quantity. We're going to measure the amount of iron and hydrogen, relatively speaking, in another object. We're going to divide that by our known quantity, and then that's gonna give us a very small number. So we're going to take a log 10 of that just to kind of give us a more workable number, excuse me, and because um, the variations tend to be logarithmic. This quantity is usually represented by Fe to H in these square brackets. And so basically a sun obviously by definition would have a metallicity in this context of zero. Anything positive, a positive number would be more metal rich than the sun and a negative number would be less metal rich than the sun. Now for stars, a typical range of metallicities would be from about negative 4.5 to about positive one. So you can see the sun is not in the middle, it's actually somewhat of a metal rich star. Now, because this is uh, just a ratio measurement, it doesn't have an actual unit. Um, so usually when astronomers talk about this, they use a unit that's called a dex. Now a dex is just short for decimal exponent. And it's just saying if you have 10 to the something, that something is a dex. So it's just an easier way to talk about it. So something that is one dex difference is a factor of 10 different. I hope that probably doesn't make sense. But anyway, if you hear dex, that's what, that's what people are talking about. Okay, so I said that this is used as a measure of metallicity, but it's specifically using iron. So why, why iron? Well, for one thing, um, iron is a metal, and <laughs> like I said, we're kind of approximating the content of all the metals based off one single metal. And iron happens to be very easy to measure in abundance from in spectra in the visible wavelength of light. And so iron is kind of an easy choice to take this sort of measurement. Okay, so why do astronomers even care about metallicity? Why do they care about this one to 2% small amount of elements in objects? Well, that's actually quite important. So there are various um, trends associated with metallicity. For one thing, we use metallicity categorize stars. So stars that have higher metallicities tend to be younger because metals were not created at the beginning of the universe. The primordial universe was pretty much all hydrogen and helium and maybe trace amounts of lithium. And so these metals had to be created in stars. So younger stars that have had more stars before them have more metals incorporated into them. Whereas older stars tend to have less, less metals because there were fewer generations of stars before them to enrich them with metals. So astronomers actually divide stars into two different populations. The population one stars are these younger metal rich stars like the sun and population two stars are these older metal poor suns, stars. I mean, I guess they're suns, but. <laughs> and now it's hypothesized that there actually existed a population three of stars, which were basically formed out of that primordial hydrogen and helium that would have been very, very large because the lack of metals kind of actually does very interesting things to stellar structure. Um, but these population three stars, while they are theoretically predicted and we have seen indirect evidence for them, and you know, it logically makes sense that in order for there to be metals that were created in stars, you would have at some point had to have a first generation of stars without metals, um, but they've never actually been directly observed. Now, because these would have had to be very early on in the universe, we have to look very, very far away to see them. Um, because of light travel time, basically the farther away you look, the earlier back in time you're looking. Um, and so this is difficult to do, um, but you know, obviously we would like to do it to confirm the existence of these population three stars, which would have extremely, extremely low metallicities, like negative six or so. Metallicity also affects the colors of stars. So more metal rich stars tend to be bluer. That is, they have more emission at shorter wavelengths and less metal rich stars tend to be redder. That is, they have more emission at longer wavelengths. And because there are important effects related to color that we can, that we use for various things, such as measuring distances and, and things like that, it's important to know what, you know, the kind of intrinsic color of a star is. And while metallicity was kind of first measured and applied to stars, and I mostly was just talking about stars in this, in this explanation, we actually also can take metallicities of galaxies as a whole and of things like quasars, which are these quasi-stellar objects. Um, and so metallicity you know, is a concept that can be more widely applied in astrophysics. There's actually important relations associated with metallicity, especially for galaxies. So there's actually something called the fundamental metallicity relation um, in galaxies, which is basically a very strong relationship that's been observed between the amount of stellar mass in a galaxy the metallicity and the star formation rate, so the rate at which it's forming new stars. Now that's galaxies, but if we move to the kind of opposite end of the astrophysical range to planets, metallicity is actually very important for that as well. 
because it can affect the uh, formation and composition of planets around a star of a given metallicity. Uh, for example, there's a very um, well-observed relation between the occurrence of giant planets and metallicity, so more metal-rich stars tend to form giant planets more easily. And this is just kind of, you know, a first, first brief touch of, of all the kind of ways in which we can use metallicity. So metallicity is a relatively simple property of astrophysical objects that tells you how much non-hydrogen and helium is in them. But although it's pretty simple, it's an important measurement that can teach us things about ranging from the cosmological evolution of the universe down to even the formation of planets and asteroids in a system. So metallicity is a great thing and I hope you learned a little bit of something. I hope you will join us again for the letter N and I hope you enjoyed this video. All right, have a good one. Bye.